Hi, everybody. Welcome to Kindred Skulls. I'm Matt Fries. I'm here with my co-host, Nick Olson. Nick, um, Greg and I tried to record this podcast probably about two weeks ago now, and I completely messed up the audio recording. So we're here for take two um, with Nick Olson. How are you doing? I'm good. You're, you're stuck with me instead of Greg. No, I'm good. It's been um, kind of the, I won't call it the doldrums yet, because it's not like we're in the middle of OTAs or anything, but like nothing has happened with the Vikings except regurgitating like, oh, what if they, what if they trade, what if they trap Bo Nix? What if they, what if they trade up and get Caleb? Like we're at like the crazy stage of just regurgit. Oh, they have a visit with, uh, uh, you know, whoever, Michael Penix or whatever. So that is, is so uh, that means they're going to draft him. Like nothing's happening. It's just regurgitating the same crazy aggregator stories. So yeah, you know, um, like, every, every aggregator I think has posted, that every single team that needs a quarterback is going to draft every quarterback that's available because, you know, they've had a visit with them. I, I think every time a, a, a quarterback visits with a team, and I'm sure it's driving other quarterback needy teams crazy too, right? An aggregator just posts it. Um, every, like literally every single 30 visit is like, oh, wow, Vikings, Jaden Daniels. I Okay, I guess that's what they're going to do. It's like, no, that's not how due diligence works. <laughs> But, and they've, they've but, had uh, yeah. literally all of them except for Caleb on the 30 visit. So maybe they're just going to get all of the, like, two through seven and draft every single one. Quasi's going gonna to get it right. Um, actually, there was a Sam Monson mock that had the Vikings taking two quarterbacks. They were they took uh, JJ, or they took Drake May and Michael Penix in that mock. So, you know, another great idea, I guess. Um we're we're going through all of them before draft day, but if they get Drake May, I don't I don't, I don't even care. And Sam had us trading down in that one, which and <laughs> not I again. You're either you're either talking about thirty visits or you're talking about mock drafts. So that's the that's the stage that we're in, like very ready for actual draft news. But uh, if that's the case, you know I, I'll you know draft whoever you want. Draft three quarterbacks after Drake May if you want, so long as we get May, I'm yeah. happy. Yeah, no, no, no. So let's go back and talk about some actual Minnesota Vikings, right? Rather than speculating about something that's going to turn into one of like six guys actually becomes a Minnesota Viking, right? And uh, people probably have forgotten about some of this at this point, right? In terms of free agency, that that initial wave is over and it turns to the draft immediately, especially when you're such a quarter, quarterback needy team like the Vikings are, right? But um. You know, I, I know you got to watch a little tape initially. I'm not sure if you got any deeper, but I, I went pretty deep on the big defenders that the Vikings signed, right? I was able to watch Jonathan Grenard, Blake Cashman, and Andrew Van Ginkel. And then they had already signed uh, Shaq Griffin by the time I got to watching Grenard and uh, Cashman, right? Because they were all in the Texans last year. So I was able to get a, a couple games that Griffin played in as well in, in terms of a tape deep dive. So I've got some pretty well-developed thoughts, I think, on those guys. And, and that's what we're going to do for the for, first portion here. Uh, you know, I, I don't know how how many games did you get on each of these guys, Nick, if you got any on Van Ginkle and the others? Well, it depends on if you double count the uh, the Texans tape for both of them. Sure. But I probably watched, probably watched four at least of Grenard, um, Cashman, and Van Ginkle and a handful of Shaq Griffin. Some, some of them, like, I would, you know, it, you count half watching half the snaps, uh, you know, for the, you know, the first couple quarters, I don't know. But I, I definitely watched at least three games of each of the each of the new guys, not counting, like, the $1 million vet minimum guys, so. No. But, and that's just, like, that's not a, in preparation for this pot. That's just because, like, we signed Grenard to a big deal, and I'm like, okay, let's see how this guy wins. Let's see what he's good at. Let's see what he sucks at um that yeah. like pure curiosity love of the game love of love of the ball you know i just love grinding tape for the fun no so. it, it's like it's it's what it's why we do this podcast right it's like what we enjoy about football a, a big part of it for me is actually watching the tape and kind of figuring out for myself and developing my own opinions on these guys for the vikings so that's why we're here right and we want to share that with you guys random question matt how do you pick which games to watch when you know you're not going to watch like um so I, I asked specifically for the games that I got and I went up and basically I wanted to grab, I just went PFF games. I wanted to grab a couple high, a couple low games. Like I, I want to see their best games. Absolutely. But I also want to see ones where they're getting a lot of snaps and on the defensive side of the ball, not recording a lot of stats, right? Like 
because you know for defenders recording stats doesn't necessarily mean a ton but if you're recording a lot of stats it's usually a good thing if you're not recording stats that could be a bad thing right so if a guy had especially if like a blake cashman doesn't have any tackles in a game or something like that like there's if there's not a good reason he's not finding the ball as a linebacker like it could be a major problem right so there's there's that dichotomy there so i i, I and i like especially for line players to see their games against better opponents right like i don't want to seek out and and i want to make sure that the correct player was starting that game right like because uh there's a game i remember way back where i think it was like chaz green or something had to start for the cowboys a left tackle because tyron smith is hurt and adrian claiborne who's like a solid rotational rusher for for a time got six sacks in one game (laughs) right so it's like you know, you got you got to be careful about the matchups when it comes to watching NFL edge rushers, right? Because if you have a bunch of scrub tackles that you're going up against, um, you know, it's it's really not a representative sample of what they're going to face on a week to week basis in the NFL. Yeah, you don't want to wind up paying big money to DJ Wanham because he gets eight sacks that are all cleanup. So, yeah, exactly. Not the big on Wanham. But. Which I I mean, did the Panthers sign? Who signed him? Somebody, somebody paid him. I, it wasn't terrible. It, it wasn't. It was, it was, the, the money wasn't that bad. And, like, honestly, I thought he had a pretty decent year this last year. So, like, I get it as an upside play. He's a valuable but, rotational yeah. pass rusher. So, and I, I'm happy for the guy that got paid. And it's funny you say that because, like, that's the exact same thing I do. I, like, I look at the good games. I look at the bad games. And I'm like, okay, if it's, like, a pass rusher, let me see him against a good left tackle. Or let me see him in the playoffs. Or let me see him... I like uh, watching Shaq Griffin. Like, let let me see when you know when he paid the played the Bengals or whatever. How did he match mm-hmm. up against Jamar and everybody? So, um, it's the same thing. I want to see, I want to see them do different roles. You don't have to like watch. It's funny. I when I first started out, I used to think like you have to watch everything, and now I realize you can kind of figure out how a guy ticks after like three snaps. You have a pretty good idea. Yeah, no, um, like, absolutely. Okay. Like, it's just like, how does he move? How 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 big is he? Like this this it sounds kind of stupid, but actually like it <laughs> it goes a long way. Um, but like for cornerbacks, I like to see them, you know, like press, bail. Mm-hmm. I like to see them uh, zone. I like to see them, you know, cover four versus um, like man coverage versus like um, cover two. Do they blitz? Um, how do they how do they fit the run? Do they actually get physical in there? Stuff like so, you know, once I've checked off those boxes, I kind of don't feel the need to necessarily watch a ton more tape. So that's kind of it's funny. I have like the I go out in PFF and I look at their worst games and their best games and I look at like um, the, their mediocre games and I see like, OK, what are they good at? What do they suck at? So, yeah, absolutely. And like uh, w- one caveat to that, like there there's like honestly a handful of plays that you can tell, like whether or not you're going to actually like this guy. Right. But quarterbacks, in my opinion, you have to watch like every single game or as much film as you can on them yeah. because it's it's so much about consistency at that position. And like it, it matters so much where like highlight flash plays are going to be the upside, but you need to also have that consistency. Um, and it takes a lot more time just yeah. to understand what a quarterback is doing. Like quarterback is the most interesting position for me to scout, but it's also like you can't just like like sometimes with like an edge rusher and it's a pat like a third down snap you just okay here's the pass rush move he did and here's what the left tackle yeah. was how he was setting and um it like you can actually figure out what's going on like in less than a minute with one play the quarterback like you have to if you really want to understand what's going on you have to figure out what the, what the defensive coverage is which by itself is already going to take a you know like five minutes or whatever and then you got to figure out what the offense is trying to do and you got to figure out like where's he looking what's he trying to do what like what's his progression which is a lot more art than science, especially when you like you're not mm-hmm. super familiar with the scheme and stuff. So it takes a long time to figure out. <laughs> and this is yeah. why this is why the NFL is so bad at predicting this stuff is it's impossible to like. Really, it takes a lot of work to to figure out quarterbacks, man. Fortunately, unless you're scouting them for the draft, um, you only got to watch one, right? Only one really <laughs> matters for your football team if that's what you care about, right? So like the guys who do the like full analysis of all the league's quarterbacks is crazy to me. Like it's, it's so much work to go into that, but anyway, long digression in, in kind of how we actually look at these things. Um, and I think hopefully we'll get a little bit more into like what we like to see on tape and, and you know, that sort of thing while we're talking about these guys. Right. So let's start with Grenard, obviously the biggest money four years, $76 million. Uh, in case you don't remember, what was it like? $48 million guaranteed, something like that, or 
42 well, million dollars yeah. guaranteed i apologize it was 42 million dollars guaranteed because hunter was 48 guaranteed um and obviously you know the vikings are planning on jonathan grenard being a daniel hunter replacement right i they're not paying him as much money as as daniel hunter so they're not necessarily expecting it to be a one-for-one one replacement right like i think we may see hopefully a bit more of a rotation last year because Denny Hunter was on the field like all the time. He played over a thousand snaps, which is insane for an edge rusher. Um, and, you know, Grenard, I believe, led the uh, led the Texans in snaps or was like a very close second to Will Anderson in snaps, right? But was playing about 60% of the snaps, whereas Hunter was playing almost like 90 plus percent of the snaps for the Vikings, right? And most teams have their edge rate. Like it, it wasn't like, oh, the Texans didn't trust Grenard on the field. It's just that most teams really have about that snap level. And I, I would say that would, was the ideal snap level for the Vikings back when we had a quality third rusher in like Brian Robeson, right back in the Griffin Hunter Robeson days where they were each getting like 60 to 70% of the snaps or maybe Robeson was down at like 50% or something like that. Um, so, you know, I, I, I expect the Vikings and granted, I, I don't think they have great depth at the edge rusher position right now, right? It's it's pretty much Grenard and Van Ginkle and a lot of the guys behind them. Like I, Patrick Jones, I think has a role, but he's not a, a player I want to see on the field like all the time, right? So they would need to add another player to be able to do that. But um, in, in terms of Grenard, I, I think he's a very, very quality starting player. Like I, I don't think he reaches the elite level of play that I believe Daniel Hunter provided you, but I think he's the very good level of play right and the benefit is that he's a younger player right he'll turn 27 before the season whereas daniel hunter turns 30 during the season so he's about two and a half years younger than hunter is and that's what the vikings are betting on right like they're not on a timeline where they're trying to necessarily i mean you're always trying to win a super bowl right but you're not necessarily expecting to be competitive for a super bowl this year given that you're going to be drafting a quarterback in the first round of the draft, right? Like you don't expect to hit the ground running year one and be a Super Bowl competitive team. The Texans who did hit the ground running with CJ Stroud, right? Were an excellent football team last year. You know, now they view their Super Bowl window as opening, right? So they can maybe invest a little bit more in a player like Daniel Hunter, um, you know, up front, have him for this couple year window when they have CJ Stroud for very cheap and then, you know, as he's aging at the end of it, it doesn't hurt them as much. Whereas the Vikings, I, I believe their logic, right, is to get a younger player under contract who's still ascending, right? I don't think Renard's reached his peak, and, and we'll get into it with the tape, but who's still ascending, and then you bring that back. I, I know we talked about this on the last episode we released, which was over a month ago. I still think Daniel Hunter at his price point is probably a better value than Grenard at his price point, like just in terms of the player comparison, one to one, but I but I get the logic behind what the Vikings did. Yeah, totally. I mean, and you can't really compare them one to one because Hunter's a two year deal, so in theory he's going to get another payday very soon, right. um, and they're paying us an insane amount of guaranteed money to Hunter. Like if Hunter gets hurt again, the Texans are kind of screwed. Whereas like the Vikings have a lot more optionality in this Bullard contract, and it's also over four years instead of two, and he's also two years younger than Hunter, so. Um, all that to say, like Hunter's clearly the better player in my mind. Like mm -hmm. one is, to me, Hunter is a top 10 edge rusher um, with flashes of elite play where you could stack him up with some of the, some of the really blue chip edge rushers. And Grenard is a, the next tier of 10, you know, put him somewhere in the 11 to 20 range. There are a lot of very good pass rushers. He is very good. He's very complete. He's not just a pass rusher. He can um, fit the run. He's not like a tremendous run defender, but like he's, he or he earns enough snaps to be like a starter, a three down starter. Um, and he's a good, he's an above average pass rusher. Um, so I, I, I think he's a good player, but I think in terms of just who's the better player on the field, it's certainly Hunter. Um, but you know, we're, uh, it, it, it is, you know, Hunter is no longer a Viking. So why don't we, why don't we get into, um, you wrote a whole article on zone coverage yes. now on, on Jonathan Grenard breaking it down. Um, what from the tape jumped out at you? Cause I, I know what jumped out at me. So I, I was really impressed with his run defense. And I, I honestly kind of would put him on par with Hunter there uh, in a little bit of a disagreement with you. 
I just think that he has the power and length to be a really, really good run defender. Um, and granted, maybe a little bit of it is colored. We talked about, you know, the, the first impressions and they matter, right? So it, it might be useful to deconstruct that. The first rep I saw of Jonathan Grenard was against the Falcons, where he knocked, I think it was Jake Matthews, back like four yards into the, into the fullback's lap, who knocked into the running back, who created a tackle for loss, right? Like it was, a, it was an incredibly explosive, powerful play. And I think that's what you get for, as a peak from him as a run defender. Um, I don't think offensive tackles are able to generate a lot of movement when he's attempting to set the edge. Like, I think he does a pretty good job setting the edge overall. Um, there were a couple plays where I saw him play the quarterback on read options. One was against the Falcons, and then there was another one. I want to say it was against the Cardinals, but I could be wrong. Um, where he plays the quarterback and then he makes the tackle on the running back. Now it wasn't like a super elite. He makes, he meets the guys at the mesh point or he makes a tackle on the running back in the backfield, but he was able to get from the quarterback to the running back and make the tackle in those situations, right? Take away the give option and still make a tackle that, that only gains a couple yards on the play. And I, I think that's a pretty impressive level, level of, of athleticism there. Um, there were a couple run plays to his side that got away from him in terms of that read option where like the quarterback made good plays. But to me, I put those plays on the linebacker behind him who wasn't playing off of what Grenard is doing, right? Like I think he was executing his assignment well. So that wasn't too much of a concern for me. Um, I, I, I think like one of the things with Grenard is that he has longer arms than Hunter does. Like he has, I think it was 34 and 70th in charms and Hunter is like 34 and a half, right? Like still ridiculously long arms, but that arm length for Grenard, I looked it up, is in the 75th percentile for offensive tackles, right? So he's got longer arms than the majority of guys he's going up against. And I really think that helps him disengage in the run game, which is something I thought he did pretty well and kind of lock out and, and helps him with that leverage in the run game, right? Having those long, long arms kind of helps him control the encounters in the run game. And I was pretty impressed with that. Um, if you flip it over to the pass rush side, this, it's is really kind of where I feel like he lags behind Hunter. But, you know, for the Viking scheme, I, I actually don't hate the fit because to me, he's an explosive first step player. And I, I think some of that comes from uh, kind of snap timing, right? Where just, just to explain it real quick, there are a couple different ways you can approach the snap. You can be watching the ball, right? And move on the first movement of the ball. You can be watching the offensive lineman across from you and move on the first movement of the guy across from you. Or you can just try to time the snap in general and uh, just, you know, you you get a feeling for the cadence of the opposing quarterback and you try to jump the snap that way. Uh, there are a lot of really successful players who snap time, right? And it's a really useful skill to be able to do, but it's not necessarily a consistent one. And it leads to players jumping off sides, right? Like one of the things that, that was remarkable when I was looking it up is that Daniil Hunter only has eight penalties in his career. Like literally he's only been called for a penalty eight times in his career, or maybe he was called for nine and one was uh, declined, but he's also only ever been called for two offsides and both of them were in 2022, right? I don't think that's a coincidence that he's jumped off sides twice in his career. And it was both in 2022 when he had Ed Donatel specifically as a coach, right? I feel like he was probably being coached to try to time the snap a little bit more in that scheme. Similarly, I think Grenard was, you know, being coached to time the snap a little bit in the Texan scheme. He might not be coached to do that or asked to do that in the Viking scheme. Now, I, I mentioned, you know, Hunter never jumped off sides. Obviously, Everson Griffin jumped off sides all the time, right? So, like, it's, it's not necessarily a scheme-specific thing. Sometimes it's a player-specific thing. But I, I think Everson Griffin was so good at timing the snap generally that it benefited the Vikings enough that the penalties were worth it. Whereas with Hunter, Zimmer probably doesn't prefer to time the snap, right? So Hunter didn't do it because it, it was kind of not Zimmer's preference. Um, you know, so with that being said, you know, Grenard jumped off sides three times this past year, right? So he's he does it a lot more often than Hunter does, right? Which helps him get a better first step off the snap. That's something that has plagued I'll say, quote unquote, plagued Hunter for years, right? We've kind of disparaged ESPN's pass rush win rate on here where Hunter's not winning in under 2.5 seconds, right? Even though it has really high pressure rates just to our eyes. And also, honestly, the PFF data backs it up too. Like he has really high PFF pressure rates and that sort of thing. Um, 
It doesn't show up in the ESPN metrics because Hunter's pressures are just a little bit slower. Grenard had a top 10 pass rush win rate and Van Ginkle had a top 10 pass rush, uh, pass rush win rate uh, per ESPN's metrics this past year, right? So, you know, I, I think that explosive first step is really helping that. I also think that explosive first step, he's really good at converting that burst off of the line of scrimmage to power into a bull rush, right? Speed to power. That's what we talk about is what we mean, what people mean when they say speed to power is explosive first step upfield try to get the tackle to overset, meaning he goes too far outside of his zone. And then you bull rush through his body with the potential to have an inside counter. And I think the inside counter from Grenard is also impressive. Like he's got a quick first step inside. Um, you know, he doesn't have super developed hands, but he's he's got long arms, so he's pretty efficient at dismissing hands from opposing linemen. I, I don't think he's great at hand fighting at this point in his career. So... He, he his bread and butter is that bull rush into an inside move where like against the Bengals, uh, he was going up against Orlando Brown Jr., right? Who's a quality tackle and one of the largest human beings in the NFL, right? Like it should be difficult to bull rush him. He was knocking Brown into Burrow's lap every single snap pretty much because he just has so much natural leverage with that arm length and has good power and has that good burst off the line of scrimmage. Um, he struggled a lot more with Jake Matthews of the Atlanta Falcons, right? And I think Matthews is a more technical player and probably played with a little bit better leverage and had a little bit better anchor because Brown is used to overwhelming players with his physical size, right? And Grenard having that length give, gave him the leverage advantage to kind of work uh, Brown back into the pocket. And this was a game where Burrow was playing, right? Like Joe Burrow was there. It wasn't like he was... You know, there was a quarterback who didn't know what he was doing in the pocket back there, right? Like Jake Browning or whatever. Um, so, you know, that was kind of interesting to me how he was extremely successful in some games. And he just completely overwhelmed uh, the Panthers left tackle, Ike Okwane, too, right? Obviously, the Panthers offensive line wasn't great last year, but he had a number of things that he did well there. Um, there, was, there was a nice spin move or two I saw on tape. What I haven't talked about so far is him winning on the outside edge. Because I, I think he's got good speed, um, and that initial burst does help him win on the outside edge in a couple reps. Um, he has a rip move that I've seen, but he doesn't have a lot of other developed moves. Uh, there, there's a couple different techniques, like a ghost technique, which is more kind of speed rushers, like your Hassan Reddick type loves to use a ghost technique, or Brian Burns is great at it. Um, but there's also, you know, the hump move, which is like the Yannick Ngakwe special, but a, but a ton of people do it. And like Daniel Hunter's signature pass rush, pass rush move is kind of like a hump move, but it's different because he's a really weird rusher, right? Um, and there were a lot of times, especially against Matthews, where I thought Grenard got stalled out with his hands, right? Like, so in a lot of reps, he has his arms extended into Matthews' chest and he's trying to push him back and he's not gaining that ground. In that case, you should be really moving your arms and trying to knock your opponent's arms down and kind of disengage from those things. So for me, you know, I, I think Grenard can develop more as a rusher into his toolkit. And I think that's something Hunter, I, I didn't have a concern with at all, right? Like I, I thought Hunter had, was is very developed in terms of pass rush moves. So, you know, I, but on the flip side, like you could say, hey, you know, Grenard, he hasn't developed this. He was so su successful as a rusher. Like, that's a really good sign because if he does develop that, like, you know, the ceiling is higher than what he's played like so far. So there's that. Um, one of the other concerns I would have with Grenard, sorry, this is kind of jumping to a different side, is, you know, he's playing across from Will Anderson, right? Opposing offensive lines are at worst equally concerned with will anderson and jonathan grenard right i think will anderson had a little bit higher double team rate so you know on the vikings he's going to be the primary pass rusher right so i'm interested to see how that transition goes um as he faces more double teams than probably he's used to but you know going back to it like i do think the explosive first step is going to help for grenard in the Vikings scheme because of how often we blitz right like with the Vikings blitz rates, you need to win really, really quickly to actually have an impact on the passer in a lot of situations. So maybe we can get a couple things with that explosive first step. Uh, another thing, we run a lot of stunts. The Texans defensive line really didn't run a ton of stunts, not nearly to the level that the Vikings did. So I saw a couple reps with him stunting, but it really wasn't anything significant in my opinion. 
Yeah, that's really good stuff. I won't um, I won't repeat things, but just maybe a few things that to pull out. So on run defense, maybe I was biased a little bit by the Ravens, who are so good, and Lamar is so good with what they do in the run game. Yeah. Um, but that playoff game, and I think I watched their first matchup against the Ravens early in the season, too. Um, I just feel like he stalemates a lot, is what I kind of saw. I didn't see him pushing guys around in the run game, but that could have just been... Yeah, the, the I, I don't I, think he gets a ton of knockback against tackles, but that's not something that I really feel like I need my edges to do. Like, I don't, like... I I think he will eat up tight ends, um, generally. And maybe not the Ravens tight ends, right? Because when they put Patrick Kirkhard, who's like 300 pounds and basically an extra offensive lineman out there, like, it's it's not as easy to do. Um, but I, I really didn't feel like... Like, Hunter did a really good job last year of compressing run lanes, right? And I didn't think that uh, Grenard was was bad at that in any respect. But also the Texans, like, it's weird because, like, you watch the Vikings run defense and they've got five down linemen on, like, a lot of those snaps. And the Texans are playing with four down linemen. So it's just kind of a different paradigm for run defense. And it creates a little bit of a weird evaluation between the two players as well. Yeah, and then on the pass rush, um, I thought from the games I watched, I thought his go-to move was that double swipe. You know, he loves to yeah. either either he like like faints his his arms out and then gets the gets the offensive line to stab or whatever, and then he swipes him down, or he'll just swipe him as he's you know transitioning from his you know his initial upfield burst, his first couple steps or whatever. So, um, and that's great, and he's good at it, and he seemed to have a lot of success with that move against a lot of different offensive tackles. I also kind of think. I wouldn't call him a one trick pony because you're right. I saw a couple spin moves, which were functional, like good. No functional is too, you know, damning with faint praise. It was fine. It was good. Um, and like, you didn't see a cross chop. You didn't see, um, I, I didn't see him just like win with just burst around the edge, um, which is, you know, <laughs> kind of like the most basic, uh, move in the book. Yeah. So, um, he, he stunt, or, um, he counters inside really fluidly. Um, and he gets to the quarterback when he wins, he wins very fast. And I think that's maybe the most exciting thing about him because, um, quick pressure matters. And that's why, you know, ESPN, he was what six highest in pass rush win rate. Um, that's how we got 12 and a half sacks last season. It's funny. Like we were kind of, um, he's not a household name, but by the, by the stats he has and, you know, the grades he has or the advanced stat metrics he has, you would think maybe he would be. Uh, but I also think there's some reasons to think like, if I'm an offensive tackle, I think he's a lot easier to scout and figure out, okay, what do I need to watch out for than somebody like Hunter who can beat you in a million different ways. So, um, but he's all that's to say, like, he's a really good player. I think he's above average run defender. I think he's an above average pass rusher. I'm really excited about what he brings in the pass rush game. Um, I don't think we've had somebody with that kind of first step um, for mm -hmm. a long time, maybe Seth Griffin or Sharif Floyd, maybe going back a little bit farther. So, uh, that's a lot of fun to to see. So I'm excited to see him. But yeah, I, I agree with a lot of what you say. I do. I will say um, he did not test well as an athlete. And I uh, I do see the first step as being like very, very good. But I think that's more as a result of him being very good timing the snap than just being, in a, you know, being Micah Parsons off the snap with his upfield burst or whatever. So um, yeah. I do think, you know, he's not going to develop into, you know, a, a blue chip edge rusher. Um, who kind of, you often need that kind of, there are a few examples of not great athletes who can do that. Um, so I think there are some limitations to his game that, you know, even though, um, you could talk yourself into his upside, you know, you don't usually think of veteran free agents as having upside the way we do with rookies, but mm -hmm. I do think he can be a very good, I, I do think he can be a, um, max out as like a pro bowl caliber guy. I don't think he's ever going to be an all pro edge defender though. So, but yeah, echo everything you said. That's what I kind of, what I saw on film. I think he's a good player. I totally get what the Vikings like, like them, see him as fitting what they're trying to build right now. So uh, should yeah. be good to see and, him on the Vikings. And here. one thing I just want to add there real quick is, you know, you, you talked about the double swipe move, which I, I think is his go-to move. My problem is like, if that doesn't win, he's not really using his hands to try to disengage beyond that. And and yeah. one of the things I, I cool. wanted to check myself on, so I went back and watched a couple hundred games, is, you know, there, there's a lot of times, especially if you go to the Falcons game where Grenard you know, loses initially and then it's just kind of stuck against uh, the, the tackle he's right, rushing against, which is Jake Matthews. And he, and he really never disengages. Hunter is always consistently fighting to disengage from the lineman across from him. And like, I, I would love to see Grenard develop that 
kind of ability as well because it's not that's not like a uh, athleticism thing or, or anything where you, like that it's a consistency and more of a technique thing right try to when your first plan doesn't win you need to have multiple counters into your pass rush plan so uh that that would be my big number one thing for him to improve on there um so let's flip it over to blake cashman right uh obviously teammates with jonathan thin grenard obviously uh went to the university of minnesota Right, so local for a lot of Vikings fans. Obviously, I've never lived in Minnesota, so um, not as as big of a deal to me. But, you know, somebody who has kind of bounced around a little bit, and we should mention, uh, I think Renard has been injured every single year of his career. Uh, he's missed games due to injury. The same is true, I believe, for Blake Cashman. He might have stayed healthy for all of 2022, but he had major, major injuries at, with the New York Jets, which is why he eventually got traded to the Houston Texans right before, you know, becoming a full-time player really for the first time last year. And and it was weird that the Texans were rotating their linebackers quite a bit. Um, and that was due to injuries, but I, I think Blake Cashman, you know, played the most snaps or he and Henry, uh, I'm sorry, he and uh, Christian Harris played the most snaps, I, I, I think, on that um, on that linebacker core. Uh, you know, uh, one of the things that jumps out, the, I mean, the first thing that jumps out to you with Cashman is how different he is from Jordan Hicks as a player, right? I think they actually have similar physical dimensions in terms of like height and weight, but they're complete opposite players. Like Hicks was a run first defender and Cashman is absolutely pass first. Um, first of all, he's a great athlete and that shows up on tape. Like I, I think he's really fluid, particularly in pass coverage right? Um, there were multiple reps of him covering tight ends in man coverage. There was a rep I thought was really impressive of him. Granted, it was only bracketing, but it was against uh, Marquise Hollywood Brown, right? Who's like a low 4-3 athlete. And he was the number three in the offensive formation, right? So he's the third receiver inside. A lot of times the linebackers task with carrying that vertical and Hollywood ran a, a straight vertical route, you know, Cashman stayed respectably underneath that. He knew he had safety help up top. Um, there was another instance against the Ravens where he was on the line of scrimmage, you know, mugging the A gap or the B gap. I, I don't remember exactly which gap and was able to get vertical. And it was Isaiah likely who's not like the fastest player in the world. Right. But he has a, you know, receiving tight end ultimately against the Ravens. And he was able to get vertical and cover that vertical route very effectively dropping from the line of scrimmage, which is something that Brian Flores absolutely asks his players to do, right? It's a very critical part. Um, there was another play too, and this was against the Falcons. Uh, so it was play action and he used a robot technique, which to explain that real quick, it stands for run over and back. It's a technique linebackers use in zone coverage against the run where, or, or against play action where they have to take a step or two forward to honor the play action as a read step. And then they need to turn around and get vertical as, as much as possible to try to cover the intermediate area of the field, because that's what, you know, the Shanahan offense loves to attack, right? They, they love to use play action to attack that area of the field. So it's very critical for your linebacker to get depth immediately. Um, against the Falcons, he was able to do it and like smother Drake London, who is running an over out. He turns around, immediately identifies London, gets on him and runs across the field with him. So that just shows the level, level of, of athleticism he has. Uh, there was also a ref against Kyle Pitts on a wheel route where he covered him one-on-one in a real, wheel route, got his hand up, and created a contested catch on the sideline that Pitts wasn't able to reel in. So athletically, he's got everything he needs to do in coverage. I think in terms of his zone feel, like you can see him consistently moving with the routes that are developing behind him in a zone, which I think is really impressive from a linebacker. So I think he's got a really good feel for zone as well. Um, you know, he's not like an extra defensive back on the field, but he he's a really good player in coverage. And that's something the Vikings were lacking because like Ivan Pace has not developed zone feel yet, right? Like Jordan Hicks, did not have a good feel for zones. And like, that's why the Vikings were able to be attacked so easily over the middle of the field. Like it's part of the reason why they were able to be attacked so easily over the middle of the field. You know, when the defense fell apart at the end of last year, right? Like our, we weren't getting support and coverage from our linebackers. And when we ask linebackers to drop in this defense, we're often down men in coverage, right? And trying to play zone coverage behind that. So it's really important to have a good coverage linebacker there. Um, if we flip it over to the run game, like 
the thing is, the athleticism absolutely shows up in the run game. If there's a run to the sideline, Cashman's going to run it down like nine, 99 times out of 100, right? Like he's got the athleticism and he has pretty decent ability to weave through traffic that's coming at him there. Um, if you've got a run where he's free and has a free run into the backfield behind the line of scrimmage, he's going to make it into the backfield and make tackles for loss. Like, and I, I don't know if he's an amazing tackler, but he's a good tackler. Like I, I didn't notice any severe tackling issues with him there. The problem becomes when you ask him to take on blocks in the run game, he just simply, and I'm, I, every time I like started to write about this or started to talk about this when we recorded the episode that I lost all of my audio on, so I can't even I can't even pull that up. Um, we like I I don't want to get too cascaded on this, right? But like he is not good at taking on blocks. Every time you see an offensive lineman engage him, he gets knocked back multiple yards. And part of it's like he's trying to sidestep the block, but he's trying to sidestep the block by going backwards, which is like a bad idea. It creates a ton of space in the run game. He's unable to disengage from blocks. I think I saw him successfully disengage from a block and try to get it on a play like a single time in the five games of tape I watched. So like he is somebody who you absolutely need to keep clean, which we praised Jordan Hicks a ton last year for being able to take on blocks in the run game and kind of being able to move forward and make those plays going forward and, and be part of a physical run defense that the Vikings had. Now, like the Vikings, I, I mentioned it earlier, a lot of times they were playing with five and surfaces last year, right? Like three interior defensive linemen and two edge rushers that helps keep linebackers clean. Like, Part of the reason Josh Metellus was so effective is that Harrison Phillips and Jonathan Bullard and those guys up front did a great job of keeping him clean when he was asked to play in the box. Ivan Pace was kept clean in a lot of cases. You know, Ivan Pace isn't great at taking on blocks directly, but he's so good at slipping blocks, and that's not the case for Cashman for me. Like, Cashman gets blocked out of the picture of plays does not successfully slip blocks. Like I, I've seen him work around blocks a time or two, but it's not nearly at the level that Pace is able to do. Um, so that's kind of Cashman in the nutshell for me, right? Like, oh, and I, I should get on to blitzing a little bit. Like he did blitz a handful of times. I saw him get stonewalled by a running back in the blitz game, right? So I, I wonder if that ability to disengage, you know, kind of works against him or the inability to disengage kind of works against him as a pass rusher as well but he's so explosive into the backfield that he got home on a couple snaps where it was like really really impressive just the speed at which he was able to get into the backfield so you know there there's definitely question marks for me with Cashman for his ability to disengage and I don't want to kill him too much for it because I still think he's a quality starter, right? Like you're not going to have somebody who's a perfect all pro player at every single position on your defense. And I think the value that he adds in coverage is a lot better than necessarily what we're losing as a run defender, particularly in the box, particularly because the way our defense is structured, like we help out our linebackers and run defense quite a bit. So, you know, with all those things saying, like I do like the signing a lot, but I have some concerns about his overall profile as like an every down player. And I think there's going to be some run liability there. Yeah. I'm really excited about what he brings in coverage, especially mm -hmm. compared to what we've been used to at the linebacker position for a long time since Barr and Kendricks really. And he kind of reminds me a little bit of Kendricks. I've said that before, but just in terms of um, the explosiveness with which he, you know, like he can, he can do a lot of things, you know, you can mug him, and then, like you said, he can carry the uh, a, a four point three, you know, the number three receiver running a vertical route who runs a four three, and he can carry him, you know, or at least bracket him upfield. Um, you could buzz him to the flat while mugging the a gap at the snap with him. Um, you can do you can play man coverage with him. So I, I feel like he's really going to be kind of like another safety, like another like little queen on the chessboard for Brian Flores to play around with a little bit, um, at least in the pass game. And also, he's a he's a really effective. I won't say he's a really good pass rusher, but I think he's an effective blitzer because yeah. he's so he's um, he's very explosive and he's like able to knife through holes in the into the backfield. So that's a good um, way to put what I was trying to say earlier. Yeah, I will say, yeah, this he's <laughs> makes Harrison Phillips job a lot. Jonathan Bullard's job mm -hmm. a lot more important because you just, just got to keep him clean. Otherwise, he just um, 
you know, he like he fits the run well. One the pro one of the problem is he's short armed, so like he can't just like if if he gets into like a you know like a sumo match with with an offensive tackle, he's gonna lose every time. Um, but also like he doesn't have that. He's not able to like shed and disengage, and he kind of just gets pushed around which you know like you can be in the right gap but if you're getting shoved out of the way because a pulling guard is smashing you off the off the screen then like that's you're gonna be giving up explosive runs so um it's bad i mean like your article you got like over two minutes of just like low lights of him getting absolutely demolished so um i don't want to harp on him too much because i am i'm genuinely excited and i think you know this is a passing league the what you can do in coverage matters more um, having a linebacker who can like play man up man against, uh, you know, carry wheel routes to the uh, upfield is, is like really exciting. Mm -hmm. I, I would rather have that than Jordan Hicks, who was a good run defender and a big liability in pass coverage. Um, but you know, there is a reason why, you know, he's, he's not, um, in addition to all the, you know, being on IR, his first three seasons in the NFL, uh, there are some question marks there. And then that's it. And that's not to say he's a terrible run defender because he'll make highlight real plays, you know, you know, chasing down outside zone. Um, you know, outrunning really athletic tackles that are pulling to to or pin pull sweeps to like to, you know to chase him down yeah. or whatever. Um, so he he does have a lot of good run defense plays. It's just when you get you know like duo run and the, and some a combo block is able to get off the defensive tackle and climb up to him. He just he's it's like an automatic loss. Like you don't even have to watch. It. So it's it, it's um, actually really kind of weird because I think his PFF run grade run defense grade was actually higher than his like pass coverage grade or something like that. And you watch the tape and you can kind of start to see how the PFF grades are formed a little bit, yeah. right? Because like this sideline to sideline stuff, I probably had about two minutes of that, like him getting to the sideline and making plays. I don't know if I actually included that in the article or not, right? But then you you come with downhill runs and yeah, maybe it's not as valuable of a thing to be able to defend that as it is to go sideline to sideline. But like it definitely matters when you can't do that at all, right? So... Yeah, no, it's it's a liability. Teams will see Cashman and Pace cross your fingers; they're both healthy, and they will design runs to get to the second level against those two guys. Which um, at least Pace can find ways. You know, he's not gonna like Pace's problem is like he'll get around the guy, but like sometimes that will result in the gap being left open mm -hmm. because he you know backdoors it or something. Um, where, whereas like Cashman just like <laughs> just disappears functionally from from the from the fit. Yeah. So um, that concerns me like i said like if you don't have a line if a linebacker is taken out of the play you're going to be giving up explosives you know you're going to be relying on your safety to make a tackle at the third level of the field um and if the safety misses a tackle you're off to the races so it's it's concerning um but um that's it's not enough to say like oh this is a mistake of signing because i, I do think everything else that he brings is really exciting and he's a, he's a good player just not a perfect player yeah absolutely like I think it's it's absolutely worth a deal. And if you look in the details of the deal, like the Vikings can get out of it after year one for basically no dead money. It's just the extra signing bonus. Like we'll have only paid him $9 million or something like that. It's just the extra signing bonus we put into future years. So really it's a, it's a good deal from that perspective too, because like at the end of the day, if, this liability we're talking about becomes such an issue that it's not playable in the defense. We can move on from him, right? Like, I don't think that's going to be the case, but it, the team kind of has a little bit of protection there. Um, so let's move on to Andrew Van Ginkle, who by the way, has a pretty similar contract structure. Like the Vikings can get out of it after this year for paying him like $10 million if they want to, and they don't owe him anything guaranteed next year. Um, but he got a two year, $20 million deal. He is going to be, it's, it's interesting, right? Because we can go direct one-to-one -one comparisons of who each of these guys are replacing, right? Hunter is, I'm sorry, Hunter is being replaced by Grenard. Cashman is replacing Jordan Hicks. Andrew Van Ginkle is replacing DJ Wanham functionally, right? Like maybe theoretically Marcus Davenport, but Marcus Davenport didn't actually play for us to evaluate somebody to replace, right? So he's replacing DJ Wanham and, you know, DJ Wanham was, I, I thought he played admirably, admirably last year, especially with the number of times he was asked to drop into coverage, which is something that's not really a part of his profile, right? Andrew Van Ginkle is the person this defense was designed around in this role because he was part of Brian Flores' first draft class in Miami, right? So, like, 
there's definitely a dichotomy in terms of the fit and Andrew Van Ginkle is a much better fit. Um, when I was watching Van Ginkle, I only actually watched one 2023 game because I felt like I could get a lot of value from watching 2021 and 2020 games where he was in the Flores defense. Um, and, and I think I did get value in that. One thing I will say is I thought Van Ginkle dramatically improved as a pass rusher from his time 2020 and 2021 to 2023, at least based off of, I, I watched Dallas in 2023, right? Um, and, and the big thing for me was hand usage. Like he's a lot better with his hands. And it's a, it's a good comparison to Grenard too, because, you know, Van Ginkle, I think, has a lot more developed pass rush moveset now that he's got, you know, the experience that he does in the NFL. I think this was last year was his fifth season, right? He got drafted in 2019. So, um, you know, he is a bit on the older end, right? He's going to be, he's 29, he's going to be 30, but that's okay. Like, because uh, it's only a two-year deal, right? It's, it's kind of the inverse of the Hunter thing and something to stabilize the position overall. Um, he's a smaller player, right? He's only in the 240 pound range, which is definitely not something that's typical for an edge rusher. But um, if, if I go into run defense first here, I know I've already uh, talked a little bit about pass rush, but I don't think he really gives up a ton in run defense despite being that smaller of a player. Like against offensive tackles, I think he is going to struggle a little bit just because of the lack of size. And he doesn't have super long arms either. Uh, if I remember correctly, where he can get controlled by opposing linemen and driven back and, and have holes created against him, right? Like he's a technically sound player. He knows where to go and run defense. And I think he's actually really, really good against tight ends. Um, the Cowboys game, he disengages from tight ends a number of times. He compresses lanes against tight ends. Like he has power and he has that ability to disengage in the run game when he's going against like players, right? 240 pounds is probably about what the size of a tight end is. If you go back in the tape to, I believe it was 2020, but I'm not entirely sure. Like he held his own against George Kittle, who's one of the best blocking tight ends in the game, in the run game. Like he was defeating George Kittle consistently in the run game, in that game against the San Francisco 49ers, right? So I go back to talking about, you know, seeing edge rushers play against high level players. Usually I mean offensive tackles, but... It's relevant that, you know, he was able to take on those high-level tight ends. So on a defensive side, like what I would say the Vikings should do is create formations where he's going against tight ends, particularly in the run game, as opposed to tackles, right? And you can do that based on how you do the formation call to the, the front call to the strength of the opposing offense. So if, if um, Van Ginkle is your strong side side defensive end, right in the run game he's going against the tight end in that case and you can put a grenard on the weak side where he has more ability to go up and take on tackles so i i think there is value and the vikings would be able to do that um as a pass rusher like i said like i didn't see a ton of pass rush juice from him early on in his career but obviously he had a great pass rush win rate metrics and he kind of dominated uh, the Cowboys in that game. Terrence Steele was in the game, although I think he was coming back from injury, right? So Terrence Steele is a highly paid starter for the Cowboys. I don't think he's like the best tackle in the world, but you know, any, and I, I believe he was coming back from injury in that game. So, you know, there are some questions to whether he was a hundred percent, but Van Ginkle was consistently beating him and he's got a great spin move. He's also got an explosive first step and kind of that inside counter. So, and, and he's got the speed to win around the edge. Like, I definitely saw a better speed rusher in Van Ginkle than what I saw in Grenard. Um, there was a there was a hump move that he deployed that was pretty effective, I thought. And, you know, just the variety of hand usage, whether it's a rip, whether it's that double swipe, whether it's kind of a, a pull move um, or, or any sort of variety there. I, I think Van Ginkle does a better job than Grenard does at that aspect of this game. It's something I, I might like Grenard to learn from Van Ginkle, right? Um, one interesting thing for me for Van Ginkle is like, I didn't think he had elite bend and ability to corner once he got to the top. It could have just been the field on that given day, uh, Miami versus Dallas, but there were like two or three times where I really thought he was going to win the corner and then he ended up slipping or ending up not being able to get to the quarterback at eight yards and kind of got pushed past the pocket. So he doesn't, to me, have like the elite ankle flexion and really it's ankle flexibility is what creates bend because you're able to 
plant your foot in the ground and bend your body in a in a specific and bend your lower half in a specific direction to get around tackles um so that, that was kind of interesting to me but like again he's not like an elite elite pass rusher but he is someone who you can put in there every down right like if you look at that size profile you might say oh you know he's a he's a bryce huff where he's only deployable on third downs right somebody you can only use on third downs because he's going to be a liability in the run game i don't think that's the case obviously you have to maybe protect him a little bit against the more powerful offensive tackles in the world but he has the technique to hold his own and disengage from blocks for tackles, even if he lacks the size necessarily to hold up, if he might get knocked back on, you know, some of the more powerful guys. Oh, yeah, I completely forgot um, about one part of his game, but go ahead. <laughs> no, no, you wrap up your. Yeah. So pass coverage. He's awesome in pass coverage. Like he his movement skills. Uh, moving backwards are really impressive for somebody who is as good of an edge rusher that he is, right? And I expect the Vikings to give him a hundred plus pass rush, pass rush snaps. There was one play that really impressed me. It ended up being a catch, but he was playing inside leverage essentially against Brandon Cooks in in that Cowboys game. And you know, it, this was like a, an off the ball linebacker thing, which Fangio was doing with him. I don't expect him us to do much with him, but he was playing inside leverage against an out route from Brandon Cooks, and he had the burst to get to the outside and contest the pass. Cooks made a really, really nice catch, but uh, Van Ginkle made it hard. And then you watch him like he was covering from the line of scrimmage wheel routes from tight ends in that game. He, I thought as well, had a good feel for zone coverage when he was asked to drop. I think he deployed i think he like rushed on tag pressures right which are the what the vikings use in their in their all-out blitz where you go up you touch a linebacker or you touch a lineman and you drop i thought he dropped on that in, in the dolphins games that i saw you know under flores better than anybody from the vikings did like the vikings weren't getting a ton of depth on their tag pressures last year and i thought it was kind of a concern underneath on those like quick hitting concepts there so i thought he did a really good job of that too so he's got he's got a lot of experience in this defense doing the things that flores asks him to do and i think he's a really really fluid player in coverage like he's not as fluid as cashman but he's a better coverage player than either hicks or pace and he's a primary edge rusher right so that that's really nice to me that he has that skill set as somebody you can truly deploy there and not really feel like he's a liability yeah, that versatility is really exciting, too. You know, just like another chess piece for Flores. You know, like I saw him smothering tight end wheel routes upfield, mm -hmm. um, which is not something you would usually expect your edge rusher to be able to do. And on top of that, like, he's he's a really fun player. Um, tenacious is the word that comes to mind. Oh, yeah, he's and high like, energy. For, he's, he's, he's twitched up, man. Like, he's, he's always, you know, he's always, you know, like another Ivan Pace type. Just like he's always finding crazy ways to win. Um, his tape is really good, especially last, last year he was PFF's seventh highest graded pass rusher, which feels fake because he's not big and he's not a brand name like Micah Parsons or, uh, or, or one of the Bosa brothers or anything or, um, Miles Garrett or anything, but he's like, his tape is really good, man. Yeah. And that's true against like good offensive tackles too. And he has a full suite of pass rush moves. I mean, despite his size, he converts speed to power really surprisingly well. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe he gets good leverage because he's a little bit smaller or whatever, but like, um, you know, he, he can win with bull rush. He likes, he likes to win with that outside swipe or outside rip. He likes to win on the outside, but he has good twitch to win inside. He's got a spin move. So he's kind of got like a full, I think in terms of like pass rush technique and fighting, he's better than Grenard um so like he's a there's a lot to like like about him even though he doesn't necessarily like some people would probably look at him and say oh he's too small too much injury history um bit of a tweener what are we gonna do it like there are reasons i think and um but uh, at the same time i think like the vikings got a lot of value here for a for a secondary pass rusher i think he's pretty darn good um and he brings a lot into the, his game besides just he's in addition to being a top you know having a top 10 pat pff pass rush grade which i do think he earned um, I think he brings a lot to the table as a run defender where, you know, that tenacity still shows up, that ferocity shows up, but also his versatility and being like a true outside linebacker in a three, four system where you can kind of do everything with him. You can line him up as a nickel. You can have buzz him to the flat. You can have a man up against tight ends even occasionally. So 
Um, that is all really exciting. And I, I think, you know, so long as he stays healthy, I think he's going to be one of my favorite players to watch in this defense next year, just because uh, I love watching those twitched up players that go crazy and kind of play with their hair on fire. And that's definitely him. Yeah, it's weird because he's not like, well, you don't see a lot of his type of player in the NFL anymore, right? Like he's a true three, four outside linebacker who gets asked to drop in coverage a lot. In college, they'd probably call him an apex player, right? Where he's playing between the tight end on the line of scrimmage and a receiver that's split out in the slot, right? Like he he could fit in those like tight mint front systems that are run in college that aren't really run in the NFL. Um, so it's it's definitely an interesting thing and, and great for Flores' defense, right? Because I think something we're gearing up to do is play more man while Van Ginkel fits into that. Um, so why don't we flip it over and go quick on Shaq Griffin. The Vikings signed him for one year up to 4.55, or I'm sorry, up to 6 mil, but $4.55 million. Um, I only got a couple games of his in. Right. And I, I was kind of watching him along with Grenard and Cashman, but I really liked what I saw from him, to be honest with you. Like he's got a weird history, right? Because he started with the Seahawks. He signed a big deal with the Jags, fell out of favor there, like was injured, ended up getting cut, you know, not worth the money, whatever. That kind of makes sense. But then he goes to the Texans last year and, you know, is it is there with injury or whatever? And then they wave him towards the end of the season right? Uh, which is a, a really weird decision because I, I didn't think he was playing bad. And it, like the other thing that I thought was interesting was I, I thought he was a pretty aggressive run defensive player. Like he wasn't making business decisions. There were a couple of nice plays against screens that he had there. So like, as far as like a, a locker room attitude thing, like, I don't really know. I, I saw a report that said the Texans, um, released him because like he was too good to be sitting on their bench right so they were kind of doing him a favor or whatever but then he goes to the Panthers and they don't like play him at all so it really didn't benefit him at all so it was, it was kind of a weird decision to me right that he was actually released so that's a huge question like the the digging down there in terms of what actually happened is weird but like he's a fluid player he's a great press player in my opinion which makes sense coming from the Seattle system right like they're a huge press bail kind of, uh, you know, and they've moved on to doing different things, but they originally, you know, the press bail cover three, right? right. That's what the Pete Carroll of Seattle was famous for. So I, I thought he was really good in that, like technically sound and press. It's hard for guys to get off of him. Now, granted, one of the games I watched was against Carolina, who had about the worst receiving core I've ever seen, including Jonathan Mingo, who can't do anything technically sound as an NFL receiver. So you know, there, there's a caveat there. But the other game I watched was against the Bengals, who he went up with, against Jamar Chase a number of times, and I thought he did pretty well covering Jamar Chase. There was a rep of him sticking with Jamar Chase on a crosser. Like, I think he's got all the speed that you need still to play in the NFL. Um, he stayed on top of things. There was a there was a really nice play, and I think it was against Chase again, where he was playing sticks defense on third down, was able to stay on top of it, make the tackle short of the sticks, right, and force a punt on a, on a third and long situation. So I was pretty happy with that. Um, in terms of fluidity, I, I think he's got it, man. Like, he can cover guys in man coverage. I I, I don't really have major concerns. I, again, against Chase, right, I'm going to call it out just because I, I like to see when guys play well against the best players in the NFL, right? Um, there was a whip route. I think he covered very effectively, like, was just on top of it the whole time. Um, there were times where he got beat, right? Like, he's not a perfect player who's never going to get beat, Um you know, and there there were one or two mental lapses I saw or like mis defensive miscommunications, right? And that's going to happen over the course of a game and course of a season. So, you know, I, I didn't get a full viewing of him, right? It wouldn't be something where I, I, I didn't really feel comfortable writing a full report off of two games on him. But like, I really liked what I saw from him as a player. I don't know how you felt. Yeah, I kind of thought the same thing. When they first signed him before the money came out, and this was when I was assuming they weren't going to go above the comp pick calculator threshold, I kind of assumed, okay, this is like your your veteran who like competes, but like, yeah. does he make the 53? Doesn't he make the 53? But then I watched his tape and I was like, this guy is too good to be like a vet minimum guy. Like this Dude, is a, he's, this is a he's, starting and, and, and here's the thing, like, I like what I saw from Makai Blackman last year. Uh 
uh, a Caleb Evans had moments. He's better than Caleb Evans and Makai Blackman right now. Like a hundred percent, he's better yeah. than they are. Probably. Um, j- not just the experience, but like he's the size, weight, the the press, the ability yeah. to like. Um, he'll get beat vertically. Like I know he ran like a fast forty or whatever, but he will get beat over the top. But he's like that. He's not slow. He's like fast. Um, just not like fast, fast. So, uh, he's a good cornerback and. Now that and then the contract numbers came out and it's like, oh, he's actually making like five million dollars, not just like mm-hmm. which is like, yeah, that's still probably competing for a starter job rather than like lock it in starting money. But at the same time, like it's a one year kind of prove it deal. Um, and I do think he's going to be given a lot of opportunities to prove it. So um, especially if they want to play more man coverage or even like zone concepts that kind of fold into, you know, like zone match concepts that kind of end up looking like man coverage. Mm-hmm. Um, he is very capable of doing that. Um, so a kind of a, a sneaky, exciting signing. Because, I mean, if you're talking about, you know, like him starting um, uh, uh, opposite Murphy, um, that's a pretty good, at least on paper, it looks like a pretty good cornerback too. And I'm with you that, like, um, I don't feel incredibly confident because there's, like, a lot of weird questions. Like, why would the Texans cut him? Like, yeah. I, I, I know... <laughs> I know I know they had other guys coming along or whatever, and so he got benched, but, like, he was his tape was not bent. It's not like he got benched for performance. Something else happened. So I, I have no idea what the story is there. And maybe the Texans just are like, well, so so they have away. young corners that they like, and then they had injuries like Stingley was hurt. Right. So I think he was playing mostly because of injuries to other guys. And then they come back and he, you know, he kind of doesn't have a spot, even though he played OK. But like still, that doesn't mean you cut a guy, especially when Derek Stingley has been hurt for like five years in a row now um despite how much yeah. i loved him as a prospect right like i don't know and he was like he was like a solid starter for the seahawks too so yeah. i i think he's a good i don't know something when you when you're paying him less you know four and a half million dollars up to six million like it it feels like you shouldn't be getting a starting caliber cornerback for that kind of money but his tape i don't know what to tell you his tape looks pretty good starting cal- caliber so I guess we'll see how he mixes in with uh, the other guys, but um, it does. It is funky. Like I'm sure the Vikings are have a better, you know, the, they're understanding the cap math a little mm-hmm. bit better than I do. Um, Nick Corte at Over the Cap, who kind of tracks all this stuff and is probably the savant at making at kind of telling um, where things are going to be. There's always like a few things that are like, oh, it seems like this team isn't going to get a comp pick. And then it comes out like the actual a picks get awarded, and it turns out the team did get it for whatever reason because there was some other uh, clause in the agreement, or the money got shuffled in some way or other, or like they, they knew the snap count wouldn't be high enough, or they knew this one guy wouldn't count for other all these other reasons. So I'm sure like the Vikings, um, not not to get into the whole comp pick section of the podcast, but like I do think the Vikings probably will stand up, still end up getting their. Do you, you want to just do the comp pick section of the podcast because this yeah, is what sure. that's what the comp pick section is in there for? To be honest with you, is the short they were signing. Gonna, I, I thought they were going to let um what's his face Reisner sign somewhere else to cancel it out, but like we got like a week left for Reisner to sign. Uh, if he signs the Monday after the after the Monday after the draft, so in you know like probably two weeks from when you're ten days from when you're listening to this. Um, he will no longer count for the comp pick formula. So I, I don't, but I, I don't think the Vikings are signing Shaq Griffin and saying like, who cares about a 2025 end of the third round pick? I think they do care. They're not just going to let Kirk and Hunter walk just for, you know, pennies, just for the kicks and giggles of it. I, I feel like they just, they must know that there's some other offsetting contract or maybe the Shaq Griffin, the incentives won't, you know, um, or the snap count won't, won't hit it because he's going to be in a rotation and they just know that he'll be below the threshold to qualify or something. So that, that um, is something that was interesting to me is like, if you look at Corte's thing on over the cap.com over the cap, the best cap resource, uh, that there is because spot track just steals stuff from over the cap. The only one really. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but if you look at that, like the, thing I find weird is Jonathan Grenard's comp pick, which is supposed slated to be a fourth round comp pick is canceling out like a sixth from the Vikings. Right. To me, like I don't under, and, and that's like the $8 million a year DJ Wadham contract or whatever. Right. So I don't really understand why a $19 million a year contract would be canceling out. Like it's supposed to be the most like is my understanding would be canceling out uh, the you know the the six round pick from DJ Wanham as opposed to the third round pick from Daniel Hunter who's getting six million dollars more a year and maybe there's something I you just can't, don't understand what's going on but you can't cancel out a higher round 
Okay. Unless you don't have enough qualifying um, compensatory free agents. So like a fourth cannot cancel out a third unless you don't, unless you have an equal number of fourths and thirds or whatever. So, okay. um, but if you, so long as you have enough compensatory, if you're losing more free agents than qualified compensatory free agents you're gaining, um, you will never lose out on your high round guys because you signed a, somebody. From now a that's below. actually really interesting because one of the things that Corte brought up and like, he's so good at this that the NFL corrected themselves on one of the teams, right? <laughs> and then there, there were like three teams, and I forget who they were, but the, the two that didn't get it, I think, were the 49ers and the Bills, right? And Brandon Bean from the Bills was asked about it. And what he said in response was basically the NFL, for some reason, and for the life of me, I could not understand why you would do this, but um, in contracts, in the void years, there's actual money that the team puts in those years, like theoretical money that the team puts in those years. And I remember this coming up from Taysom Hill back in the day. So like while Andrew Van Ginkle's contract is like a one year deal with like three or four void years on the end of it or something like that. Um, it actually in the language of the contract, there are real dollar values attached to that number. Right? So the interesting part becomes Apparently what Brandon Bean said is that the NFL for some reason was counting the dollar values in those void years as part of the AAV of those deals. Jonathan Grenard has void years in his contract. So like if his void years are high enough and you want to put those void year numbers high because you're not allowed in, in certain circumstances, you're not allowed to go over them in contract negotiations, what the void years are. So, if Jonathan Grenard has those that pushes the AAV up, he could just cost a third round pick. Like that, I'm sorry, that's super big brain and and really nerdy in terms of how these work. But that's that's interesting. I did not actually know that portion of it where you can't counsel all out a higher pick. Um, so yeah. So I I think that's and and I think that's why. That's some of the logic behind losing Hunter and signing Grenard. In addition to getting younger um, and, you know, you, you know, avoiding the Hunter injury history, not that Grenard doesn't have any injury history, but you're also, because they, they, the, the salary bands match them into different buckets, you get, you still get a compensatory third. So if you think about like, is Hunter for Grenard an equal swap? Probably even when you factor in youth and everything, probably not. But would you swap Hunter and a third for you know like would you get grenard in a third for hunter like that you know that starts yeah. to tip the balances a little bit a little bit more yeah no that's that's fair too um no interesting so let's hit on quick uh other free agency moves uh we we hit on a lot of the previous ones but there was one re-signing additional re-signing the vikings had i'm a big fan of it uh jonathan bullard one year 2.25 million i think bullard absolutely provides value as an early down run defender Right, he's not a pass rusher by any means. Um, although he might have had like one sack last year, and it was actually really sweet. When I went back to watch uh, Hunter, I watched the game against the Saints, and that was where Bullard had a strip sack, and it was like a, a six spin move or something like that. But <laughs> early down run defense talked about how important keeping Cashman uh, clean and pace clean in the second level is. I think that's what Bullard is here for, and like understanding what his role is and what his job will be i think he'll execute it fine yeah no i agree with you i mean everything i say about harrison phillips and why i love him and why he's an underrated glue guy applies to a lesser degree but also applies to bowler just like a very solid player and we need those kinds of players with the linebackers that are playing behind him so um good deal not super expensive deal um they don't have a very good interior defensive line but like you know, you're not going to go out and spend $30 million for some guy who's not that good. So I don't know. Um, I, I like the, the cheap approach. Yeah. You know, if you're going to go cheap, Bullard's a good guy to give a lot of snaps to. Yeah. Um, and then for Jerry Tillery, I feel like uh, him and Bullard, I'm like the Gordon Ramsay meme where he's like, oh, dear, oh, gorgeous in the one side. And he's like, you donkey. <laughs> on the other side or the meme of the guy in the train where like one side's super dark and one side's bright and sunny where it's like, I just don't care about the Jerry Tillery signing at all. Like I, I understand that 
you know, he had some pass rush use last year or something like that, but he is not a serious rotational pass rusher on the inside. And I think the Vikings still have a major need at that point to me, like even with that signing, like he, I, I wouldn't be shocked if he's a camp cut, um, to be honest, maybe he fills that role, but I'm not holding out any hope that he's going to be able to. Yeah, he's, I think you've got two starting interior defensive linemen who are primarily run pluggers who, you know, yep. take on combo blocks and don't let guys climb. Hillary gets pushed around in the run game. Just, you know, like he does not, he's too inconsistent. His hands are just very inconsistent and that makes him struggle in both the run game and the pass in the pass game. That said, you know, he still comes with that first round pedigree, which does translate to the athleticism and the fluidity with which he moves. I think he can be an effective looper on stunts. Um, and I feel like if you run a lot of stunts with him, he can get pass rush wins um, at a decent clip um, for an interior defensive lineman. And he's like, he's also capable of like beating guards one-on-one as a three tech. So um, not like super good at it. Like I said, he just doesn't seem very coordinated in his pass rush plan. Um, but he does have solid athleticism. And I do think, you could deploy. You, you could find ways to deploy him on pass rush downs, but I think if he makes the team, he's a pure rotational pass rusher. Um, and you know, for you know, two three million dollars, that like for that's fine considering they have absolutely nobody who can rush the passer right now on the interior defensive line. So yeah, I'll take they, it. they added a couple more uh, players for interior de- defensive line depth. Uh, Jonah Williams, who I haven't watched at all, I kind of like there's the Jonah Williams who it was the tackle for the Bengals who signed with the Cardinals. And I was under the impression that that was the only Jonah Williams in the NFL. So I was wrong on that. <laughs> um, we have the one from the Rams who was a defensive tackle. Uh, Rams fans seem to think like he played pretty well. And he, he last year when he was in and he might be a, a piece, but you know, he's kind of an undersized defensive tackle as well you know, another defensive line body. So maybe we get some pass rush juice there. I just really don't know much about him. And we also signed Jihad Ward, who's been in the edge rusher his NFL career, but he's like big for an edge rusher. He's 6'5". He's got long arms. He weighed in almost 300 pounds at the combine, but I think he has uh, slimmed down a little bit since then. So he's kind of more of a base and run defense type who I think would be, you know, either competing with like a Patrick Jones, right, in terms of trying to take Patrick Jones's role, or maybe if you feel like you need a little more oomph than Andrew Van Ginkle in run defense in certain situations, you put him in. But I don't think he's like going to be a high snap player. Like I don't think any of these guys on the defensive line, with the exception of Bullard on early downs, are going to be high snap players. I could see Jonah Williams playing a lot of snaps just because he did it for the Rams and he didn't suck at it. But sure. he's not he's not a pass rusher. I feel like he's uh, the Harrison Phillips version of like a five technique, um, like, a, you know, not uh, he's not in he's not a one. He's not a nose guard. He's not going to be playing there, but he will line up on, you know, the inside shoulder of the tackle or the outside shoulder of the tackle um, and kind of plug the run. So wait, when you're running those odd down fronts, when you have like two like nose guards or two like true 300 pounders, 330 pounders. And you have like the one five technique on the outside chair of the tackle, but who's still functionally engaging with offensive linemen. Like, I feel like Jonah Williams can be your guy there. I feel like Jihad Ward is more of a, I, I want to call him like a pass rusher, but I also think he sucks. So I, I don't want to like <laughs> play him up too much, but like he's another body and we'll see if like they can get some, some pat, but like, I don't think, I don't think Jonah Williams is going to be your pass rushing guy, but you know, like, you know, he can, he can be your Jonathan Bullard when they're in an odd front. So um, I don't know. We'll see. We'll we'll get we'll give him to to Mike Pettin and see if he can you know guss anything up out of these guys. Yeah. No. Um. So, uh, uh two offensive signings as well. Uh, one Dan Feeney, who's a guard. Who I don't know if you guys remember back to 2017, but he was one of the guys with Pat Elfline and like Forrest Lamp and all those guys who was like, oh man, the Vikings really need an interior offensive lineman. It'd be great to get one of these guys. We got Pat Elfline. We thought it was great. It was not great. Um, so actually it was good the first year and then he broke his ankle and maybe that uh, hurt him a little bit. But, you know, Dan Feeney's kind of bounced around the league a little bit. So he's depth at guard. You know, it wouldn't shock me at all if he ends up, 
going the Jesse Davis route or something like that, where he's just gone by the end of training camp, right? Doesn't see a significant amount of snaps, but hey, we need depth on that interior offensive line, right? We're still down a left guard starter, so it's kind of interesting. We also added Trent Sherfield on a less than $2 million deal. You know, he uh, was coming over from the 49ers, I believe, but played the most snaps a couple years ago. Um, he'll be in the third receiver competition, right? Where we don't even have a solidified third receiver right now. You know, Brandon Powell, I, I would pencil in as that player, but he really wasn't for the Vikings last year, right? That was KJ Osborne. Um, really like what I saw out of Powell last year, but, you know, Sherfield, I think, has a reputation as a bit of a dirty work player too, right? Like it's something we need in this offense in, in terms of the ability to block, but he hasn't done a ton as a receiver throughout his career. Yeah, it's interesting with the Feeney signing, if that is, like, the, we still don't have resolution on Reisner. And by the way, the, like, the Vikings could sign Reisner after the draft, too, and yes. not have a count for compact purposes. So, um, like, it, it sucks we wouldn't get a compact, but we, you know, like, it wouldn't, I, I, well, I guess we, you can it, always well, resign your own. Well, we sign Reisner, it doesn't matter. matter. Because... Yeah, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm out-clevering myself, I'm out-lawyering myself, but... um. But like with Reisner as a whole on the roster, I think right now you would probably assume Blake Brindell is the yeah, starting left sure. guard, which he's it doesn't suck. I don't know. Um, so I, I think Feeney, the, Feeney the, interesting. the thing I with Brandell is I would love to have Brandell as like that sixth offensive lineman, right? Like I think yeah. that's where you really get value out of him as a presumed starter. Like you start to lose a lot of that value that I think he provides. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then Sherfield, like yeah, he's a he's a good blocking wide receiver, but I don't I don't see a path to a lot of snaps for him because Powell I think has the special teams locked up and he has um, wide receiver three. I won't I wouldn't say locked up, but uh, like he was functionally a wide receiver three for a lot of last year. So um, I don't see him losing that. And um, I I like some of the other wide receivers on the Vikings behind him as well. So um, we'll see. I don't know. To me, he's he's a guy who is on the roster bubble, but we'll see. Yeah, absolutely. Like, and none of these guys got significant deals, right? Like, all of, we mentioned Tillery two point seven five. Everybody else was under two million dollars. So it's not like the Vikings are breaking the bank for any of these guys. Um, one last note. Uh, really happy to see Harrison Smith is remaining a Viking. Right? I think we talked about this, where you know the Vikings could say could have saved a lot of money by cutting him. So it looks like they're setting up for retirement. I don't know if we ever got complete contract details on over the cap or something. Um, but they adjusted his contract. He gets $9 million total this season. So a lot of that came in a signing bonus. The rest will be salary. Um, and he has, I believe the reporting I saw said he has a minimum salary in 2025, which basically sets him up to retire in 2025. And I think they voided out the rest of his deal where he had like three years maybe left on his deal, like into 2026 or something like that. So, you know, it really looks like he's probably not going to be a Viking in 2025, but we get him for the 2024 season, which is awesome. Um, because I, I think he was still a solid player last year, even if he wasn't his peak, like all pro best safety in the NFL kind of level. And I, I think he provides a lot of value to this defense as a leader, as a team that like lost basically everybody who's been on the team for more than two years at this point, right, with Hunter going and, you know, and Hicks, who is another veteran presence as well, leaving. So it's a, I think it's a win-win for both sides, right? Harry gets to remain a Viking. He gets more money this year than he would have gotten on the open market, right? There are still a bunch of older safeties who will remain unsigned and the Vikings get to keep some cap space. Yeah, I think in terms of cash, it's like it, they reduced, or in terms of like Harrison Smith's long-term income they reduced it by like six ish million um but in as part of the deal they also gave him more t void years tacked on or I, I, maybe they like included a, a bonus to salary conversion and together with a salary reduction so basically they reduced that's how they reduced his cap number down from like 20 million down to like 7 million yeah. so vikings freed up a lot of cap space in addition to um saving freeing up the cash um and so it's a good situation for him Obviously, great to see Harrison Smith. I, I honestly thought he was going to be cut or, you know, the Vikings weren't going to be able to come to a resolution. It would have sucked to see Harrison Smith have one, like, random thinky year for the Titans or some somebody random. 
um, you know, ruin his jersey. So to see him retire a Viking would be very cool. Um, but that's not to knock on Harrison Smith. He's no longer his athletic prime, uh, but he's still a very good, I think he's still a, mm -hmm. an above average safety um, in terms of what he brings, in terms of his intelligence, his toughness, uh, his tackling ability, his ability to read quarterbacks, like all those things have only gotten better with age. So um, I, I still think he's a good starter that you can lock in uh, with Bynum and, and Metellus, if you want to count Metellus as a safety as well, because then the Vikings a very strong safety rotation. So I just pulled up over the cap to try to figure out those contract details. And I learned that we signed Camus Grugier Hill, who's like a 30 year old linebacker who's got special teams written all over him to me. So he's just going to be a depth rotational player. Uh, breaking news for something that happened uh, at least a week ago on the Kindred Skulls podcast. <laughs> uh, there now, you go. So the Vikings currently have about $17 million in cap space. We mentioned Dalton Reisner. That's somebody I'd like to see them use it on. And by the way, they're going to need to use like eight to even up to 10 million of that, depending on how far they trade up for a quarterback on the draft picks, right? Because like the first round quarterback is actually pretty expensive. Um, uh, the early first round, you know, pick is, is pretty expensive against the cap. So you know, they don't have exactly $17 million to play with, but, you know, it's a pretty decent chunk and change. They could go after a wide receiver three if there's somebody they like in free agency or a starting left guard, right, if they want to bring back Risner or somebody like that. So, you know, they've got options to fill in after the draft, depending on what they're able to add in the draft and how they feel about their depth afterwards. Obviously, um, you know, that was pretty quick on the cap, but let's flip it over to talking about the draft just a little bit here. And we're not going to go into the quarterbacks. Um, we are planning an episode a little bit later where we will do a much deeper dive into each of the quarterbacks who, you know, are being rumored to the Vikings, right? There are like six of them who are like, you know, at least first round in first round consideration. Um, but the major question is like, when are the Vikings going to take a quarterback, right? Because that is really what matters. You know, like I could do a PFF mock draft simulator and have JJ McCarthy fall to me at, at 11 and say, I'm good to go or have all four quarterbacks get taken and, um, you know, be stuck with like Michael Penix or Bo Nix at 11 or something like that. Right. But like, I almost certainly want to trade up in this draft. Right. And it's like, where are we going to be able to go for me? And I don't know if you read it the same way, like Caleb Williams is absolutely with a, with a bullet number one, like there's, that's rock solid. There's no way that's not happening at this point, just based on how the bears have acted, frankly, this whole process, like it's very clearly been there going with Caleb. Um, Jaden Daniels to me has always seemed like number two uh, to, to Washington, like since maybe not, you know, during the season, but I, I think that's pretty solid. Like I would be able to be willing to lock it in that Jaden Daniels is going number two. Would you agree with that? Or do you think there's like a chance May goes there? No, I mean, before you're kind of reading tea leaves with um, like, there was a lot of smoke between like them signing Marcus Mariota, getting Cliff Kingsbury, you know, guys who like, you know, they, they look like they value that kind of mobility and what they can do in the run game, with that kind of quarterback. So um, there was some piece in the tea leaves that made it seem likely. And then some kind of like the, you know, the, the random Twitter nobodies who like, um, a, a massive following who are suggesting it. But, like, now, at this point, like, Adam Schefter is saying, like, yeah, it seems, really, really seems like, um, like, they're, they're, Washington is set on their guy. Um, so, I, I do, I am kind of, at this point, I feel like Jaden Daniels is, a, is, I wouldn't say, like, a done deal, but, like, I would be very shocked if he's not number two overall on draft night. Yeah, so the Vikings made a move already in the draft that, um, we have not covered because it happened after our, our most recent podcast episode. That's what you get for podcasting like every month and a half or so. Um, so they did trade up for 23. This shouldn't be breaking news to anybody listening to this. But, you know, it's it's kind of an interesting move because they gave up two seconds and swapped a fifth round pick for a seventh round pick with the Houston Texans, right? And it depends on which calculator you use. I kind of made my own trade calculator. Um before I think Ben Baldwin came up with one for his website. And the, the thing with the Baldwin one is it discounts future picks by like 10% or something like that, which is a small value. I don't think that's necessarily representative of how teams do it. I think teams really treat it more like, you know, and you'll see this on the draft where teams will trade like a future second for a third round pick, 
or something like that, right? They they kind of treat it like it's almost uh, I I so the they kind of treat it like it's almost like discounted by a round, and that depends on the circumstance, right? Like nobody's trading a future first for the um like. 64th overall pick in the second round, right? Nobody's making that kind of trade. But, you know, generally, picks a year out are, I would say, are not worth 10% less from a team value perspective than um, maybe from an analytics perspective they are. I don't know. But the interesting thing here, right, is when you trade up in the draft, you pretty much almost universally lose on the analytical trade charts, I'll call them, right? Like Chase Stewart has his AV chart, Fitzgerald Spielberger, there's a chart that's based off of contract value, and then Ben Baldwin has his own chart as well. Um, you almost universally lose those charts. But the ones that are more interesting to me are the market value ones, right? Like Jimmy Johnson is the standard, and like if you hear Daniel Jeremiah on NFL Network talk about doing trade value, he's using the Jimmy Johnson chart. Rich Hill from Pat's Pulpit also came up with a chart that actually looked at historical trade data where Jimmy Johnson just kind of made this up in the 90s, right? And people have been using his values ever since. Rich Hill looked at what actually happens with the trades, right? So I like to look at both. And I think, you know, generally to argue your case for trading down, like the analytics ones, the analytics ones are great. But if you're winning on the Rich Hill and Jimmy Johnson, that to me says you won on the negotiation side of things. And it's really interesting for the Vikings to me because the Vikings obviously take a bath on, on the analytics ones, but they are very close. They, they lost slightly on the Jimmy Johnson chart and one on the Rich Hill chart with my calculations. Now, again, I'm calculating it slightly differently than that Ben Baldwin calculator. So like, I think we lost slightly on the Rich Hill chart on the Ben Baldwin calculator, but it's like close. It's within the margin of error, right? That we're winning on this move up to 23. So... If you look at the caveats with the analytics charts, basically they say trading up for a quarterback is different and doesn't apply to any of the sort of analysis that we're using on these charts. Like if you can trade up to a quarterback, there's value in doing that, right? So the Vikings in this move, like I've heard it talked about as if they might have to give up value twice to be able to make it work, right? Because they're giving up value to move up to 23. But based on my calculations, if they're winning on the Rich Hill chart and trading up for a quarterback isn't the same. Like if, if 23 gives them more negotiating power to move up than the than 42 and the future second did and the fifth, seventh swap, which is basically like spare change in this case, right? If it gives them more negotiating power, which I think it does, right? Like, I, I don't know how you feel, but I feel like 23 for a team in the top 10, for a team in the top five is going to be more valuable than two seconds, um, 42 in that future second. So... I think it's kind of a win for them. Um, I don't know how you feel about the whole thing. I kind of went on a rant, a tangent there. No, yeah, no, I think that's the right analysis. And I think there's a couple things. One is that um, you don't pay the future year discount when you're moving up for a quarterback now. Um, so that means you can outbid the Giants. The, well, mm -hmm. you're always going to be able to outbid the Broncos because they don't have any picks left from, you know, paying a first for Peyton and then paying up three firsts for Russ. But, um, but like the Raiders, like the, I, I don't think teams are going to be able to, to beat two current year first round picks. Um, that is just um, a very attractive proposal. Um, and the other thing I will say that it really gives the Vikings is it gives them negotiating leverage because they can say, well, fine, we'll just take Penix at, at 23. Mm -hmm. We'll just take Bo Nix at 23. Like you're going to ask for, you know, Justin Jefferson and three firsts for the number third for the third overall pick. Um, you know, good luck with that. Uh, enjoy destroying Drake May, and we we will go ahead and take you know QB five or whatever. Who like who knows? Like Lamar Jackson was also QB five, so and went at the end of the first round. So not that you know obviously Bo Nix, Penix maybe has some upside. You know some doubt, some risk with the injuries. Not to get into the quarterback discussions, but like you can at least credibly say, well fi fine, we'll, we'll you know we'll, we'll we're not going to overpay for a quarterback. So to be able to say like we have a second first round pick, we can take best player available and still get a quarterback. At, with the 23rd pick, which you can probably kind of guarantee that, you know, those guys, I think will be one of those two guys will be available at 23. Um, that's a good position to be in. And also, uh, if you're trading down with a team who wants to take a quarterback, like say the Patriots, I think it, um, it makes it a more attractive offer to them to say like, Hey, I, I know you guys kind of are interested in Drake may, maybe you don't feel like you have the offensive architecture in place for him. 
uh, to, mm -hmm. to thrive right away. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you still need to have somebody throwing the football there. So like you can, you can move down and the Bo Nix can run, you know, can sort of captain your ship and you can see what you get out of him or Penix. There's a lot of up, you know, he's got big army did, did a lot of good things in college. You can see if you can continue to build on the progress he made and you can kind of guarantee that you're going to get him. And also, you know, you can also get yourself a starting caliber left tackle or, yeah. Uh, starting wide receiver for your team two at 11. So I feel like it gives you negotiating leverage to say, hey, um, I, I have backup options that I can credibly take. But it also gives teams like, hey, they can also take that same that backup option. In addition to saying, you know, like nobody's going to be able to beat the Vikings offer for number three, number four, number five, where, wherever they end up moving. So um, that all, all that in addition to everything you said about value, I think makes it make a lot of sense for the Vikings and gives them a lot of optionality. Yeah, and that's kind of been the thing for me too. Like with the with the Vikings right now, you know, I I see so many people talking about like every NFL podcast that I listen to, like general NFL, not Vikings specific podcast. When they talk about the Vikings going up for a quarterback, they talk about them giving 11, 23 and a 2025 20, first. And I don't know how you feel on this, but like I don't think it should necessarily cost the Vikings that much because I think 23 is viewed as more valuable by NFL teams than a 2025 first, right? So if you look at like the assets that the Raider, because it's like, to me, if I'm the New England Patriots, right? Either I love one of the quarterbacks enough to take them at three, or I'm not taking a quarterback, period. Like if I if I don't love Drake May, you know, uh, J.J. McCarthy enough to take them at three or Michael Penix and Bo Nix. Like, obviously, they're not being talked about in that range, so it's very unlikely that they do. But, you know, if I don't love one of those guys enough and I think I've got so many holes in my roster, I'm going to trade down and I'm going to take the best offer available to me because the offers are there, right? If the, if the Patriots love Drake May and want to take him and are like affirmatively, yes, this is our guy, there's no price the Vikings can pay to get up into that spot, right? You would agree? Like, if if you're a quarterback-needy team and you have the option to get your guy through the process, there's you cannot trade off of that, in my opinion. I, I don't know if you feel like teams would operate the same way, but, like, I, I don't see how you move off of that. So you have to suppose that the team is willing to trade down from that pick, right? Like there's no amount of value the Vikings can give that team for them to trade down from that pick if they truly want the quarterback. So then all the Vikings have to do is beat the other offers that are on the table, right? From the Broncos and the Raiders specifically. The one thing that's scary is if the Giants want to jump into the mix, right? Because, you know, we've seen historically, it might cost two first round picks to go from 11 to six, or something like that, right? So if a team loves Marvin Harrison Jr., right, let's say, or like loves the top three receivers and are scared that they're not going to be able to get them at 11, that gives the Giants a little bit of an advantage in negotiating because they could send the 2025 first and the 2026 first, right? And that could outbid the Vikings. I, but I think that's like the only scenario where I see the Vikings getting outbid because they have the two firsts this year. I don't think they really should need to spend the 2025 first, because if you look at it from a raw offer perspective, right? If the Bronco, what the Broncos can offer is like 12, a 2025 first and a 2026 first, right? If you think 11 and 23 are more valuable than 12 and a 2025 first as a team. And I, I think teams will think that then the Vikings shouldn't need to offer their 2025 first because you're making up that value of 23 and you just have to offer the 2026 first. So to me, like, I, I don't see the Vikings having to, I'm sorry, this is another tangent rant, but like, I don't see the Vikings having to offer that 2025 first because just like logically, I don't think the other teams can reasonably beat 11, 23 and the 2026 first. So why pay more? It's kind of my thought process. Yeah. Yeah. And to be honest, I would really hesitate to throw that 2025 first into the mix because the Vikings are probably not going to be world beaters next yeah. year. You know, it's kind of a rebuild. You know, they let Hunter and Kirk walk. So you're not projected. Vegas has them as, you know, the by far the worst odds to win the division. Um, and they're sitting at like, you know, I forget the exact over under, but it's like seven, eight wins next year, maybe even less than that. So um, that you don't want to end up in a Panther situation where you, oops, I gave up the first overall pick. Um, and not only that, time, we already traded our second, right? So we'd be we'd not have a pick until the third round in that case. Yeah, yeah, you'd be kind of screwed. Now that said, 
If that's what it caused to get Drake May and the Vikings fully believe in him, okay, I'll, you know, if he's the guy, he's the guy. Uh, I get it. Um, I'm not saying I would pay anything, but, like, three firsts, and including one, the, the, the fact that you had to trade up for one of them, like, I will I can live with that if it ends up being a quarterback of the future. Um, but other than that, like, no, I and I don't really think they would need to, especially for, like, QB4. Like, that, that seems kind of silly to me, so. Yeah, no, and, you know, I, I agree with you. Like, honestly, I don't really have super strong opinions on the quarterbacks in this draft at this point. I'm almost intentionally trying to not create, like, oh, I like this guy over the rest of them, just for my own sanity when the Vikings do take a quarterback in this draft. But I will say, like, from my perspective, I'm kind of, like, playing this from a psychological perspective where I want the Vikings – to fully believe in the quarterback that they are getting, right? I don't necessarily care who that guy is. I want them to believe in him. And if they believe in him, there's not really a cost I wouldn't pay because, um, you know, I like literally if you hit on the quarterback, it doesn't matter, right? If you get a high level quarterback and you spend four first round picks on him, you're not going to be complaining about those four first round picks when you have a, even up to like a Trevor Lawrence level player, right? Like you're not concerned with those picks when you get that good of a quarterback on your roster on a rookie deal. So I, nah, I might disagree with you a little. Like Trevor Lawrence is a good example because like Jaguars need to put more pieces around yeah. Trevor Lawrence for him to succeed. So at some point it's a balancing act between right. like, like do you, do you win with like the good enough guy, the Kirk Cousins, uh, I know we just saw that not work, so we're not, you know, we don't really want to go down that road. But, like, um, can you also, if you give all these first-round picks, like, the Vikings have a lot of other needs besides quarterback, too, that we have to think about, like, long-term. Who's sure. going to play interior defensive line for this team because you can't find them outside the first round? Who's going to play edge rusher? Who's going to play cornerback? Um, you can't just build the whole defense out of scraps, and Brian Flores is, you know, like, a, a, a genius. So, um there's you do to me especially quasi being like a wall street guy you do have to do with the cost and the benefits analysis um so i i i, do, I feel like you have to have a point at which you would walk away from each of these deals oh 100 um, percent. but but at the same time like if it if it ends up being like a, oh wow that's a high price to pay even compared to the trey lance precedent or whatever the sam darnold precedent I will, I will be fine with it because if it ends up getting a quarterback that they value that much, that's pretty exciting too. I think on one hand, like you can't give up your negotiating leverage and just pay whatever a team asks for on that trade. But on the other hand, I, I think being willing to, to be aggressive and spend a lot and spend maybe more than people might think, you know, it should take, I might be what you need to do to get it done. And if you love the guy, like, I don't have a huge problem with that. A at the same time, like, if you don't love the guy, like, there's no reason to pick him at all, right? So maybe the only guy in this draft class the Vikings love is Caleb Williams. And obviously, with all the rumors that they're trading up, that's not true, right? But at that point, like, you can't just take a guy just to take a guy. So it yeah. it's kind of a yeah, you can't, interesting you can't balance act. draft Bo Nix and say, well, Brookler has him as QB6, even though we think he's going to freaking suck. Like that's not, it's not how it works. Yeah, no, so. like, uh, like they're like from being a fan, I totally get the wisdom of the crowds aspect, right? Where you're like, all right, you know, we do, we're not great at evaluating QBs from the outside, but from a team perspective, like you need to put your full force of trying to make this guy successful behind him, and just psychologically, you're not going to want to do it for a guy you didn't believe in in the first place. So it's it's one of those things where. I want to avoid half measures at quarterback because the position is so important, which is why I'm rooting for the Vikings to trade up because it shows me that they believe in the guy that they're moving up for. It's a, it's a really weird logic to get to that place, but that's where I'm at with it. Yeah. So, uh, this was a long episode, Nick. <laughs> Don't look Old at the drums time. Of it's late. Free agency, free draft, and we're still cranking out. Hour, hour and a half, almost two hours. So yeah, well, that's what happens when we don't get together and talk forever. It's just we have too much to talk about. So Backlog. we have to, uh, and we have more podcasts on your way. You're, you yeah. know, at the two hour mark, and you're like, oh man, I wish I had another two hours of this. Yeah, um, we'll have another pre-draft episode, like we previewed, um, with potentially friend of the podcast Luke Braun, um, and then we will obviously be with you with uh, after the the, the the craziness of draft night. So more to come. Yeah trying to work it out so 
that's all we got for today. Um, tons of stuff that we that we were able to cover. Uh, hopefully a little bit different from what you're hearing on Vikings podcasts these days, right? Like everybody, I guarantee, is talking about the draft nonstop. So we got a little bit of the draft talk in there at the end, but we talked a lot about guys that are currently on the team. So, so I think there's some value in this. Um, Nick? It really was- dovetails into the draft too, not to like yeah. extend this podcast even longer, but like talking about where Andrew Van Ginkle and Jonathan Grenard and Blake Cashman fit into this team and even Shaq Griffin, not only does that, that tell you, like, okay, here are some needs that have kind of been addressed. Here are some needs that are still open, like interior defensive line. But it can also tell you, like, the kinds of cornerbacks they're looking for might be a little bit more of those size, weight, speed, mm-hmm. prototype athletes who can who can be trained into playing man coverage. I mean, you could also play got draft guys who can play man coverage, but those guys tend to go pretty early because good man coverage co- cover corners are hard to come by in college. So, um, like, but that, like, I, I feel like, I'm not going to tell you who they're who they have their eyes on for like day three of the draft, but I do feel like this kind of what you're seeing Flores and how he's reshaping the defense through free agency does inform schematically what kind of guys they're going to look after in the draft too. So um, it all kind of fits together. Yeah, absolutely. So with that, I'm Matt Fries. You can find me at Fries Football. He's Nick Olson. You can find him at Nick Olson NFL. Um, our co-host Greg is at the Greg Blake on Instagram. Uh, we are at Kindred Skulls on Twitter. We're available on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. We're also on YouTube, so you can uh, watch us talk about this, right? Uh, we don't really add much in terms of the visual effects, but it's good stuff nonetheless. Check us out. You can spy subscribe. on me and try and figure out what books are on our bookshelves. Give us a like. Yeah, check it out. Um, but no. Nick, it was great. Uh, Hope to do this again very soon. And Skull Vikings. Bye, we love you. This time, another first-round corner probably would do us harm because we kind of want a quarterback, but (laughs) we'll still play you out. (laughs) You still get to hear the outro anyway. Play it. Cool, baby. Another first-round corner wouldn't do us any harm. Oh, another first-round corner wouldn't do us any harm. Oh, another first-round corner wouldn't do us any harm. And we'll all cheer on behind. And we'll score the old Vikings along. We'll score the old Vikings along. Hey guys, this is Matt. First of all, just wanted to say thanks for sticking through that very long episode for you. And I've got a little special treat at the end here. Um, You may have heard me reference a couple times during the episode that Greg and I actually recorded a a similar version of this and we ended up losing it because I recorded it incorrectly. Well, we did have Greg's audio from that episode and he went on a pretty awesome rant about why it makes no sense that the Vikings were going to trade Justin Jefferson, like Patriots fans were kind of speculating, um, as a part of a move up to three. So here that is as a little special treat. Let's be very clear on Kindred Skulls, okay? There is one thing. We, we the three of us disagree on almost everything. <laughs> you know, we disagree on stuff all the time. And that's what makes it so great to me. I love talking to you guys because you don't think like me. And sometimes I'm like, what? Um, th- th- let's be very clear. Justin Jefferson is not getting traded. He wasn't he wasn't available a year ago. He wasn't available as soon as the season ended. He's not available now. He's not available tomorrow. He's not available after the draft, during the draft, during the season. He is not available. This entire conversation has ballooned beyond the concept of reality at this point. Justin Jefferson is not a throw-in for the top 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 three pick he is a player you trade for number three and some more okay you don't you don't add him as a throw-in that's insulting to justin jefferson it's insulting to the minnesota vikings it's insulting to me as a fan it's an insulting insulting idea fuck patriots fans for even suggesting it it's so stupid and fuck vikings fans who engage with it endlessly online what the hell is wrong with you people we're not trading jefferson justin jefferson get real holy shit the whole reason the whole reason adding a rookie quarterback is a brilliant idea right now for this team is that we have the players in place who can make that young man's transition to the nfl very seamless he'll have tools 
He'll have support. He'll have the best receiver in football to throw to. That's why it works. You don't trade that guy just because you're desperate. What the hell is wrong with people? Oh, my God. That whole conversation, it's the first time I've really spoken on it because I just, I can't even believe people are having it. It's such a brainless operation discussing whether Justin Jefferson should be traded. What the hell are we talking about? He's not getting traded. 